Hi, and welcome to Why Do Countries Exist, Episode 6, Angola. So we return to Africa and go to our first sub-Saharan African country, and the first Lusophone, or Portuguese-speaking country. Angola borders the Atlantic Ocean to the west, Namibia to the south, Zambia to the east, and the Democratic Republic of the Congo to the north. It also borders the Republic of the Congo, due to its small enclave of Cabinda. Geographically, the country features rainforests in the north, dry savannas in the middle of the country, highlands in the east, and deserts in the south. Angola is an ethnically diverse country, with 31 million people in it, is mostly made up of Bantu-speaking people who make up roughly 95% of the population. Among Bantu speakers, the Omvibundu, who live in the central highlands and make up 37% of the population, the Ambundu, who live north of them around the capital of Luanda and make up 25% of the population, and the Bakongo, who live in the north of the country, who make up 13% of the population, are some of the largest ethnic groups in the country. Others, such as the Chokwe in the east, Ovambo in the south, and the Khoisan in the southern deserts are all active in the country. There also is a small community of mixed people at roughly 2% of the population, and a white, mainly Portuguese community, at 1%, and surprisingly, a Chinese community who make up another 1%. Angola has many languages, with each ethnic community often speaking their own titular language, along with maybe another local language, and often Portuguese. Angola had previously been a Portuguese colony, leaving an important mark on the country, with Portuguese often being used for business and politics. In terms of religion, most Angolans are Christian. Roughly 56% are Catholic, while another 35% are Protestant. Folk religion also plays an important role in the country, with 5% following folk slash tribal religions, and many Christians often practice a syncretic version of Christianity, mixing indigenous African and Western beliefs. Angola was first settled by Khoisan hunter-gatherer peoples. They were forced out of much of the country by the new Bantu agriculturalists starting in the 6th century CE. The first political units would start to form towards the start of the second millennium CE. The most prominent of these would be the Kingdom of the Congo, formed in the north of the country by the Bakongo people in 1390. The Kingdom of the Congo would at its height control territory making up much of northern Angola and the coastal coast of the DRC in the Republic of the Congo. It had a high population concentration and became an important trading point in Central Africa, trading natural resources like ivory, manufactured goods like pottery, and most famously in later years, slaves. Congo had a highly effective army that helped to conquer rival states and tribes in the region. The kings of the Congo, known as the Mani Congos, had a large amount of political control, likely being the most powerful people in all of Central Africa until the mid-1600s. In 1483, the Portuguese began entering into the kingdom. The Portuguese brought with them both European goods, gunpowder, and Christianity into the region. In 1491, Nzinga Anuqua, or João I, would convert to Christianity and become a Catholic. Catholic missionaries would spread throughout the country, and churches would be built all over, especially in the city of Mabanza, Congo, which was for a time renamed to the city of São Salvador to sound more Portuguese. Most in the country would become Catholic, with connections between Portugal and Congo growing closer. European-style buildings and masonry were brought over, and Congo began to westernize more and more. However, relations would begin to sour between the kingdom and the Portuguese. Slavery had always been practiced in the kingdom, with its army attacking rivals and taking those they captured as slaves. However, citizens of the kingdom would not have to worry about becoming slaves unless they committed a crime. The Portuguese began trading European goods for slaves so that they could work on the plantations in the island of Sao Timo, or later in Brazil. While at first the kings of the Congo were happy with this, they quickly began to have second thoughts once the Portuguese began working with illegal slave traders to gain more slaves and work around Congo's rules. In a series of famous letters, Mavemba Azinga, or more famously known as Alfonso I, would write a series of letters to the Portuguese king, asking for the Portuguese to halt this illegal slave trade. However, the Portuguese continued on, and while the Congo rulers still liked European contacts and Christianity, they began to grow more worried about European influence and interference in the region. Congo experienced major turmoil starting in the mid-16th century due to a combination of Portuguese meddling, a series of military defeats to eastern tribes, and infighting. They lost several tributary states, including most famously the Mubundu Kingdom of Ndongo in the south. The Portuguese also founded Luanda in 1576, which served as the start of the Portuguese colony of Angola. By 1622, things had reached a boiling point, and the First Congo-Portuguese War broke out. The Congoese were defeated at the Battle of Mubumbi, and allegedly, many of its important political leaders were eaten by a group of African bandits known as the Imbengala, who worked with the Portuguese. Two years later, the Portuguese would suffer a defeat at the Battle of Mabanda Kasai. This would lead to the Portuguese merchants and Jesuits priests in Luanda to revolt and force the Portuguese governor out. This largely ended the war, with the Portuguese releasing many of the Congolese slaves they had in 1624. In 1641, the Dutch who had been fighting the Portuguese throughout the world allied with the Congolese in the kingdom of Nadongo, led by the famous Queen Nzinga of Nadongo, and took the city of Luanda. The Portuguese, who were largely unable to defeat all three powerful players due to wars against Spain that forced Portuguese attention to remain back at home, lost many of their cities and forts in the region. However, in 1649, the Portuguese 
Portuguese sent a fleet to Luanda and recaptured it, forcing the Dutch out of the region. Without the Dutch, Nzinga was forced back into the interior and lost most of her kingdom to the Portuguese. By 1649, the Congoese had made peace, leaving only Nzinga left to fight. While she would fail to retake most of her kingdom's original land, she expanded in the east and managed to continue fighting until 1657, when she signed a peace treaty with the Portuguese. She would continue to rule until dying at age 80, in 1663, Congo and Portugal would again fight in 1665 at the Battle of Mbiwila. The result was disastrous for the Congoese, as the king, along with 500 other nobles and title holders, were killed or captured in the battle. Mbiwila would lead to a civil war as rival factions fought for power in the kingdom that had lost most of its leadership. The civil war would result in the capital of South Salvador being sacked and the kingdom being divided in two. The kingdom would eventually reunite in 1709. Congo would be a shell of its former self, losing most of its political clout in the region and many of its neighboring clan kingdoms gaining full independence. The kingdom would continue to exist until becoming a Portuguese vassal in 1859 and being fully absorbed into colonial Angola in 1914. Also, two small side notes about slavery. First, after the Battle of Mbiwila, many of the nobles captured in the battle would be sold as slaves in Brazil. Many of these nobles would escape and form a proto-state made up of escaped slaves in northern Brazil that lasted until 1695. Also, the slave trade in the region would continue until 1836 when it was abolished by the Portuguese. Legal slavery itself would continue to exist until 1854 when it was banned. Portugal had largely only colonized a small section of the coast around the Wanda. They hadn't pushed much further in the interior, mainly due to a combination of both instability at home, along with many of the colonists that we brought over dying from either disease or from warfare with the local peoples. This situation began to change towards the mid 1800s. Portugal had industrialized, and pressure was put on Portugal to expand their colonies around the world, both to gain access to raw resources and to show to other European powers that they should be taken seriously. Much of eastern Angola was taken during the late 1800s. At one point, the Portuguese had intended to connect their Angola colony with their other colony of Mozambique. However, the British, wanting to connect their colonies in Egypt to South Africa, prevented this and forced Portugal to accept British control over Zambia and Zimbabwe. It should be important to note that no local peoples were consulted, and geographic and ethnic considerations were for the most part ignored. Portuguese colonialism favored the assimilationist model. The Portuguese often called their colonies overseas provinces. They tried to encourage Portuguese to move to Angola to civilize the territory. They built up the infrastructure of the region, and even attempted to give some measure of civil rights to Africans. However, in order to become what would become known as the assimilado, an African had to become Christian, speak Portuguese, have a civilized job, Job and get a Portuguese person to sponsor you. This effectively prevented most Africans to join the assimilado class. Those who didn't have the assimilado status were treated as second-class citizens and often forced to work in the mines or in the farms for little pay and with few rights. Portuguese rule was also noted to be corrupt, and until the 1920s, dominated by foreign businesses who would often exploit the Angolan, and these foreign businesses would take the money they made and take it out of the colony. The Portuguese colonial government was corrupt due to a combination of general disinterest at home, in the state of the colonies, and economic and political crises that Portugal suffered from during this time in its history, largely neglecting the colonies. In 1926, a military coup ended the first Portuguese Republic, and by 1933, the fascist Estado Novo was formed. This new government, led by Antonio Salazar, changed course and began limiting foreign influence in the colonies. The Portuguese began to favor the idea that stability was needed in the colonies rather than growth. The colonies were thought to be reserved for the mother country, and the resources and riches extracted from Angola were to be taken straight to Portugal. The Angolans were upset by these colonial policies, especially after World War II, when the processes of decolonization began across Africa. The decolonization in Angola is generally seen as being led by three different factions. The first faction is the National Liberation Front of Angola, or FNLA, although they wouldn't be called that at first. They were formed in 1954 and based around the Bakongo people in the north, and promoted a center-right style of government. They were led by Holden Roberto and backed internationally by the United States and other Western powers along with the DRC. The next group was the People's Movement for the Liberation of Angola, or MPLA. They were formed by urban Africans in 1956, supported largely by the Mubundu people, and promoted a Marxist style of government. They were backed by other left-wing groups in Africa and abroad. They were especially favored by the Soviet Union, Cuba, and the Warsaw Pact. They were led by Austin NATO. The third group was a breakoff from the FNLA, and was called the National Union for the Total Independence of Angola, or UNITA. They were supported by the Ovimbundu population and promoted rural agrarian interests. It was led by Joan Savimbi, who broke off from the FNLA in 1966 after they refused to make contacts with Angola's southern population. They were at first backed by China and believed in more Maoist ideas of government before switching to a more hard-right conservative position after being backed by apartheid South Africa and the United States in the late 70s. There is, however, a fourth independence group I want to talk about, known as the Front for the Liberation of the Enclave of Cabinda, or FLEEK. They were based mainly in the Cabinda region and created in 1963. Cabinda had been under Portuguese rule since 1885, and according to Cabinda separatists, was treated as its own distinct region from Angola. They wanted a Cabinda independent from not only Portugal, but also from Angola. Cabinda was, and still is, incredibly rich in oil, with 60% of Angola's oil coming from Cabinda, making it a valuable region. 
Fleek was mainly backed by France. By 1961, Angola had erupted into revolt against the Portuguese, with the four nationalist forces attempting to free Angola. This also corresponds with revolts breaking out in Portugal's other African colonies, which became known as the Portuguese Colonial War. Portugal used brutal means of repression to try and stamp out the Angolan rebels, and were largely successful. The nationalist cause wasn't helped by the fact that all four movements hated each other and fought each other just as much as they fought the Portuguese. The war continued on until 1975, when a leftist coup in Portugal brought down the Estado Novo government, and the new Portuguese government granted Angola its independence. Around 300,000 whites and pro-Portuguese Angolans fled the country following independence. Immediately after independence, civil war broke out. The MPLA took the capital of Luanda, forcing the FNLA and UNITA out. The MPLA was assisted in driving the these two factions out by Cuba, who had sent roughly 18,000 troops to aid the MPLA. The FNLA was routed, and while many were able to fall back to the DRC, they lost most of their political and military clout and remained on the sidelines for the rest of the war. UNITA, while also driven out, was able to retain control of most of the southern regions and began an insurgency campaign in the south. Fleek had little political legitimacy before the war, and the MPLA managed to drive them into the interior of Cabinda. The MPLA managed to control the capital and gain international recognition. Nito became the first president of Angola and worked to establish a socialist government. Many industries were nationalized, women were given a place in the political process, and advisors from Eastern Bloc countries were brought in to help the MPLA. Workers' rights were improved, although many still remained in poverty. The MPLA was the only legal party in the country, and while Angolia industrialized, corruption began to increase, and repression against those who spoke out was brutal. In 1979, Nito died of cancer and was succeeded by Jose Eduardo dos Santos. Savimbi, leading UNITA, and with backing from South African troops and American military assistance, began reclaiming large amounts of Angola's south. The MPLA and Cuban troops, while able to prevent UNITA from taking the capital, were largely unable to drive UNITA out of the country. Savimbi uses Mao's training he'd received in China to great effect and ultimately led his forces to battle against the MPLA. Savimbi is seen as an expert in the field and often portrayed as an intelligent political leader by those who support him, while his opponents often accuse him of war crimes and simply being power hungry. Regardless, the civil war would rage throughout the 80s until in 1991 when a ceasefire was declared. Multi party elections were scheduled for 1992. The elections were based on the winner winning at least 50% of the vote. However, neither Eduardo dos Santos nor Savimbi won this 50% of the vote thus forcing a second round of voting. UNITA quietly went back to rearming its militants. What followed became known as the Halloween Massacre, with MPLA supporters and government troops killing opposition supporters, with thousands to tens of thousands dying in the massacre. UNITA went back to war, but were unable to retake the capital. In 2002, after 27 years of fighting, Savimbi was killed by government troops in eastern Angola, thus bringing an end to the war. However, in Cabinda, Fleek still continues its conflict with it to this day, waging a limited guerrilla struggle against the government. Eduardo dos Santos' government began reforming the country towards a more social democratic model, with the MPLA moving from a Marxist party to a democratic socialist one. Foreign interests and companies can now operate in the country. Multiple parties are allowed, including both UNITA and the FNLA, but the MPLA basically controls the country, with freedom of speech and assembly severely restricted. The president effectively controls the country, with very little limits on his power. Corruption is still high, and the wounds of the war remain deep. Thousands of landmines still remain in the countryside, and many have been displaced due to conflict. In 2017, Eduardo dos Santos stepped down, letting Juar Lorenco to take the position of presidency. This also notably occurred after an incident in 2001 where Eduardo dos Santos said he was going to step down, and then, after Lorenco stated his interest in becoming presidency, changed his mind. Even today, it is believed Eduardo dos Santos has a significant influence on the country's policies. However, despite its difficulties, Angola has progressed. Luanda has seen significant development, and the Angolan economy is one of the fastest growing economies in the world. Literacy and life expectancies have increased. Angola has seen a recent surge of immigrants coming into the country. The first are Chinese who have arrived due to many Chinese companies operating in Africa to both rebuild African countries suffering from the long-term effects of colonialism, to increase Chinese soft power in the region, and to make money off of Angola's oil, diamonds, and iron. The second group are Portuguese moving into Angola, often with little previous connection to the country. Many have moved to Angola due to tough financial conditions in Portugal after 2008, with many of these migrants often making more money than they would have in Portugal and having a low cost of living. So why does Angola exist? Angola is the kind of country we'll be seeing a lot of when looking at Africa. It is an artificially made country. Angola exists because the Portuguese and Europeans set the borders and foundations of it, not the native Angolan. But Angola exists and is working towards becoming a highly developed economy and an important player in modern Africa. Its resources and people ensure that Angola is something that the world will have to look out for in the coming years. Next week, we will go to the northwest and travel to the first American, Caribbean, and island country, Antigua and Barbuda. Prepare for slavery, the British, hurricanes, and for a little bit, a mountain named Obama. Thank you. My email is whydocountriesexist at gmail.com for if you want to send me suggestions, thoughts, feelings, or hate mail. I hope to see you next time. I also apologize if the mic quality suddenly got really, really weird in there. I don't know what happened, but hopefully I'll be able to fix it. We'll see. Anyways, take care. The sources for this episode are a 1990 documentary on the Angolan Civil War, Ancient History Encyclopedia's article on the Kingdom of Angola, 
the article Antonio Salazar and the Reversal of Portuguese Colonial Policy by Alan Smith from the Journal of African History, the DW News video The Rise of a Colony, extra credits series on Queen Nzinga, Geography Now's video Angola, the Great Wars video Portugal in World War I, Home Team History's video Kingdom of the Congo, Max Hammond's video The Portuguese Colonial War, Mr. History's video A Super Quick History of Angola, the new Atlantis documentary Made in Angola, the PBS clip on the city of Mabaza, Congo, the article Portuguese Colonial Policy by Eduardo Morier from the International African Institute, and Wikipedia.